Welcome back to Future Bank Today, a community dedicated to helping foster innovation in our financial institutions. This is your host, Jim Kittredge. Today we're going to begin a four-part discussion on the virtual cryptocurrency Bitcoin and the technology that powers it blockchain. The potential impact of these two technologies on business and banking in particular is greater than any innovation I know of over the next 10 years. There's only one problem we have. We are so far up the hype curve, it's almost impossible to distinguish between the real potential and all of the associated hype that is being thrown into this space. I don't know of a single major financial institution that doesn't have either a pilot, a prototype, or an investment in this space over the last 12 months. So how do I know that we're climbing the hype curve? It's simple. Four out of every five people I either speak with or hear talking about either Bitcoin or blockchain really have at best a cursory knowledge and experience in either one. It's always highly frustrating to be on the hype curve for those of us who really have a passion for the potential of an innovation. To sort this out, I use an easy three-question test when someone's trying to pitch me as to why I need to be in this space. So here are the three questions. One, do you like Airbits or Bread better? Two, Kraken or Coinbase? And my third and final question is, how many blocks do you wait to confirm your transaction? If they look at me like I'm speaking ancient Egyptian, I just move on. They're just talking with absolutely no clue. In order to better appreciate the potential of Bitcoin and blockchain, we need to understand how they came into existence. So what is a virtual currency, in particular that versus a real currency? Well, a real currency, it's officially known as a fiat currency, is issued by a central government and is backed in some way by that government. A virtual currency is not issued by any government, but rather any entity where a set of users agree on what value it has. Now, some of you might conclude that a virtual currency has no, quote, real value, but think about it. What value does a government-issued fiat currency offer that is beyond an agreed value by all the users? It's been 70 years since the Bretton Woods Accord removed the gold standard, which pegged the dollar to a specific quantity of gold. In many aspects, all fiat money only differs from virtual money because we users agree on a relatively stable value. So let's talk about Bitcoin, the first virtual currency. Or was it? Actually, it's not even close to being the first. You need to go back a few years to the first. In fact, you need to go back all the way to 1896 to a company called Sperry & Hutchins. It rolled out the first virtual currency known as S&H stamps. For those of us too young to remember, S&H stamps were sold to gas stations and supermarkets who gave them out as bonuses to shoppers, who could then redeem them in the S&H catalog for specific merchandise. By the 1960s, the company had issued three times as many stamps as the United States Post Office. But alas, by 1970, S&H had run its course from a business model standpoint, and it began to wither on the vine. This came about because competition from large chains just cut out the middleman, that is, S&H. The next virtual currency mania began in 1981, when American Airlines launched American Advantage, the first airline frequent flyer program. Say that fast a few times. Today, every airline and even car rental company and most hotels offer some version of a frequent flyer program. How big has it grown? Well, by 2005, The Economist magazine estimated that the total value of unredeemed miles was worth more than all of the dollar bills in circulation. Airline miles are sold with variable pricing ranging from one cent to 10 cents per mile depending on market conditions. They can be spent at an ever-growing number of places and be used for a number of services. Amazingly, 
even paying for funerals in some cases. Over the last 10 years, airlines have made more money selling this virtual currency to credit card companies and hotels than they've actually made from flying the planes themselves. Another fast-growing currency, although it's pretty unusual, that is expanding incredibly rapid is in Africa. Since few people in Africa have a bank checking account and local currencies have huge volatility swings, people there are turning to their mobile phones which have a significant market penetration and they're using purchased prepaid minutes as a currency. In fact, it has grown so large it is now a multi-billion dollar a year business. Most shops and shopkeepers gladly accept prepaid minutes as currency. There are even companies like EasyTop out of Dublin, Ireland that help customers buy and sell minutes and send them anywhere in the world. Minutes can be sent internationally via the web, text messages. They're accepted in over 450,000 shops in more than 20 countries. Who would have thought? So is Bitcoin at least the first online currency? Nope. That would be a company called eGold, which was founded in 1996. eGold was unique in that it was a virtual currency that was actually backed by real, honest-to-goodness gold bullion, something no other kind of even fiat currency can boast today. It was the same as swapping gold ownership, albeit anonymously. But at its peak in 2008, eGold had over 5 million accounts. However, weak security systems contributed to its ultimate demise in 2009. And there were others too. Things like beans and flus, and in China, something called Q coins. But these two ran into those same security issues, and in the case of Q coins, ran into governmental issues that caused their ultimate short lifespan. In the late 2008, Two new, both high potential virtual currencies launched. Bitcoin and something called Facebook credits. Both sought to correct the security problems of the previous attempts, although in vastly different ways. Facebook credits died an early death in 2012, not because of security or fraud, but most likely because it could only be spent within the Facebook world, which at the time was significantly smaller than it is today. Although I am not sure, I doubt this is the last time we'll hear from Facebook on this subject. So that finally brings us to Bitcoin. In August 2008, three individuals file a patent application for a new sophisticated encryption technique based on heavy mathematics. The three also register the name Bitcoin.org in October 2008 under the name Satoshi Nakamoto, a white paper was released on the internet. It revealed a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash to the world. In this vision, they managed to solve the problem of money being copied, security, which provided for a vital foundation to Bitcoin. That foundation was known as the blockchain. By January 2009, the first block, codenamed Genesis, was launched and it allowed the initial mining of Bitcoins to take place. We have not looked back since. And let the mania begin. I think this is a good place to pause for this week. As next week, I'm going to do a primer on what blockchain is and how exactly does it work. I'm going to do my best to model it after the talks that you can see on that fantastic subreddit known as Explain It Like I'm Five. Absolutely one of my favorite subreddits. So stay tuned. Thank you for your time today.